Good morning. My name is James Theory. I'm with the University of Illinois. I'm a small farms educator based in Kankakee, Will, and Grundy counties of the University of Illinois. Um, and I'm based in Bobone. Today we're going to talk about cover crops in small gardens. I did receive a comment from uh, one of the registrants that they thought that cover crops are just for, for large-scale farmers, field crop farms and so forth. But uh, as we shall see today, it's also for a backyard garden. Any piece of ground can be covered using cover crops. And so let's begin by defining what a cover crop is. They are plants that are planted to cover the soil rather than for the purpose of being harvested. In other words, the goal is not to make money out of them. It's not for our food. It's actually for soil food. You're trying to enrich the soil more and that will become clear as we go along. And yet another definition talks about a crop that's grown for the protection and enrichment of the soil. So you have a picture there showing a cash crop. And in between the rows of that cover crop, instead of leaving that bare for the sun to be scorching the ground and the earthworms escaping the heat by going deeper into the soil, plant something else so that that ground is not left bare. In other words, we are behaving like mother nature. Mother nature, if a ground is suitable for something to grow, she will plant something. We may call them weeds, but she's just making sure the ground is covered and that's how it should be. That's what we are practicing. We can start by talking about the advantages of cover cropping. And these four cartoons here show us what cover crops can do. And throughout this presentation, the question will always be, what do you want your cover crop to do? You've probably done a soil test or you know from time, you know, uh, yesteryear and the year before that your crops are not doing great and you suspect that your soil is not good enough, is not rich enough with nutrients. In other words, the soil quality is poor. But in recent years, because we've always thought of soil as an inert or dead entity, we've changed the term quality to soil health. Now we know that only living things have health. And we want to think about soil as having health too. And if you didn't know it, there's more life underground than above ground, whether it's by numbers, actual numbers. I mean, you just need to take a teaspoonful of soil and it's teeming with bacteria and other microorganisms. So there's more life underground than above ground. And that life underground is helpful to us indirectly because those microorganisms enable the plants we grow to access the nutrients there are in the, you know, the ground, if there are any. So building soil health with cover crops is a major thing. And you'll see that in the course of the presentation. Then if the ground was left bare, just think about it. The water would just seep through the layers of soil and with it, it might, not just might, it will carry nitrogen because nitrogen is very water soluble. And so if it gets to lower and deeper areas where roots will not go, then we lost that nitrogen and we'll be running to whatever to buy more of the synthetic fertilizers. You can stop that from happening by having cover crops which you will scavenge or sequester or absorb or grab those nutrients that would otherwise have been lost in rainwater. 
So that's another major issue with or major advantage with cover crops. Then think about it. If you have bare ground, water from rain that is pounding on there, first of all, splashing itself is micro erosion right there. But then when water, amount of water builds up and starts flowing, it takes with it a lot of soil. Now, topsoil is a valuable resource and to replace an inch of soil, I think they say it takes 100, 500 years, who wants to wait that long? On the other hand, if you have strong winds blowing, you know, there's dust, that's also a form of erosion. That would be eliminated if you have a crop. Any plant that is growing on there will stop both processes from having those bad consequences on the, on the topsoil. And finally, well, and there are the advantages, but over here, the last uh, advantage shown is that you have weed reduction. And anybody growing vegetables, outdoors especially, when we ask them what's their major challenge or number one challenge, always, they always say it's weeds. And so if you can grow a cover crop and help you uh, manage weeds, that's desirable. Any farmer would want to, or any gardener would want to have that advantage. And I know some of you are naturalists. When you grow cover crops, the bees, as that cartoon, little cartoon there shows, and other pollinators have a place to go to to forage for nectar and pollen. So that's another advantage right there. Let's talk a little bit more about nutrient absorption and nutrient sequestration, nutrient scavenging or capture. The plant you see on the left-hand side right here is a, it's a kind of a mustard. It's, it's a brassica plant. It's radish. And because it does the job of tilling the land for us, uh, you can see very well, um, you can see well that uh, you can see very well that it is absorbing all these nutrients and N is, nitri N is nitrogen, P is phosphorus, K is potassium, S is sulfur, C is calcium, all this would probably be wasted away if this plant didn't grow. It needs all this for it to grow. So it will capture them. And what happens in winter? It dies because it cannot stand the uh, winter time temperatures. In its place, a channel is left. And in this channel, water can now percolate or go into lower depths of the soil, soil structure. Besides, it's going to decompose and decompose very fast. And so these nutrients are available for the next crop that you're going to grow. And the roots will have an easier time going into the lower levels because channels have, also, have already been made there. And if I was an earthworm, I would want to use those channels that were left behind by the dead um, tillage radish. And we'll be talking about radish uh, in, a, in a little detail, some, some elsewhere. We know that when we grow crops, they absorb nutrients, they absorb nitrogen. And in this diagram here, I have shown you that if you had, if you applied compost to your garden, you'd have enough, like seven parts per million of nitrogen in the soil, and that would be your maximum. Meanwhile, if you used fertilizer, which is shown in the broken blue line here, you'd have a whole lot of it, twice as much, and that would peak in July 18 as, you know, in terms of availability for the plants. That's the best time because that's when plants are actively growing, it's warm and it 
the ground is wet. So everything being pitched, the plants will grow great. But look at when you um, combine compost with a cover crop, you get the same advantage as using synthetic fertilizer. Indeed, the nitrogen becomes available sooner. May 12, you already have nitrogen becoming available as opposed to it being more available with the synthetic fertilizer like in June, right here. So there are two advantages here. Compost and cover crop are organic, and that's good for the environment. Using NPK in a, in a synthetic fertilizer is undesirable because one, it's spoon feeding the soil, you have to do it every year, whereas with compost, you could skip a year. It's slowly this uh, nutrients here. And then the expense involved and the carbon footprint involved is way much higher than when you use organic fertilizers. So this is telling you that use of cover crops clearly do confer an advantage in our gardening. Uh, and farming systems. So we then want to set a goal when we select cover crops. What might be your problem in your garden or in your vegetable farm? What might be your issues? We already talked about weed control. We already talked about shortage of nutrients. We already talked about erosion prevention and from the talk on um, the slide, we showed you the tillage radish. You saw that soil can be amended. So if you have very compact soil, or you have like in my garden where clay is the main component of the soil, it gets very hard. And so if you can plant the tillage radish, it will break up, loosen up, compact and dry, I mean bad soil, like the clay soil. And there are examples given here. If I need to have a good residue cover, and by the way, sometimes you just wanna do this cover crop because you don't just want to see bare ground. It might be just that simple, which is the first statement right there. All you wanna do with control, you can use all these suggestions here, cereal rye, triticale, barley, wheat, or oats. On the other hand, if your soil is short on nitrogen, which is always a major nutrient that we always seek, you can use crimson clover, hairy vetch, or soybean. These three are legumes. And we know that legumes, under the right conditions, are able to fix nitrogen using uh, a com um, an association with bacteria in the soil. And we'll mention that in a second. So, and note here, we're not just talking about nitrogen scavenging or sequestration, absorbing from the soil. We're talking about making nitrogen that will be available to subsequent crops. And so, yes, we talked about nutrient scavenging, and these plants are all good, and we'll talk about them. Erosion management, oats, cereal grains, annual ryegrass, and clover. So here, you don't have to be thinking of just legumes or grasses, a combination will do it. And then the soil structure, if you have the compact soil, tillage radish will do the job for you. The Midwest Cover Crop Council, which is MCCC, helps you make a decision on what is your, the best cover crop to go for. This website or this tool was developed by Michigan State University. And all you have to do is give your location and what you need the cover crop to do. Remember, you need to set a goal for what you want your cover crop to do. And because uh, USDA has maps, soil maps of very many places all over the United States, certainly in the Midwest, 
then it will help you uh, make a decision. And in this slide, which is just a magnification of the previous one, it is asking you for lots of information and it, it's, it's very uh, easy. And I'm, I'm going to do a demonstration at the end of this presentation to show you how this works. And as always, what do you want your cover crop to do? That's a major thing to always keep in mind when you select your cover crop. The first type of uh, cover crop that we're going to talk about is cereal rye, pretty much used by a whole lot of people. It's a perennial. It has an allelopathic effect, and I need to explain this term here, but some of you know that under a walnut tree or close to a walnut tree, you cannot grow solanaceous crops. The tomatoes, the pepper plants, the eggplant, those kinds of plants will not grow because there is an extract or a chemical, if you may, uh, that is produced by the walnut tree that tells all these solanaceous crops that you cannot grow here, this is my space. So that's an allelopathic effect. Same thing with cereal rye, it will not let anything else grow among it or after, immediately after it, because of the chemicals that it releases into the soil. Well, that, that might be a good thing because if it's weeds trying to grow, I mean, not all of them will be affected, but some will be affected, and that's a good thing. But then it's not a good thing if you're trying to follow up with your veggies, especially the small seeded vegetables like carrots and lettuces. They're not going to grow immediately after you've removed the cereal rye crop. You'd have to wait a few weeks for that to happen. That's the allelopathic effect. It's a great soil builder, not as much as other rye grasses that we are going to see because most of its energy is concentrated in the upper portion of it, the plant that is, and more foliage is produced than the roots. But still, you still get those roots uh, building the soil, either through porosity, increasing the porosity, the pore spaces where water and air should go. Or even um, you can think of just the organic matter produced by the roots as well as the upper portion of that plant. It's a great nitrogen scavenger, so you get that quite a bit. It has more biomass than other small grains, which is good. We just talked about it, putting its energy more into the foliage. And that's great for organic matter. An issue might be voles. Well, if I was a vole, I would want to stay in a place like this because it's well protected from predators and it's cool. I can find food there. I can raise a family there without too much of uh, having to worry. So yes, that might be an issue, but you cannot win all the time. It will root deeper than some other small grains. Okay, we'll give it that. And then you imagine that uh, biomass that you are seeing top right hand picture here. If it's fly, if, uh, if it is fallen over and just left on the ground to lie and decompose, and you come along and plant your pumpkins, cantaloupes cucumbers into it, because it will be a good mulch. You will not get your fruits dirty. And then when you walk in there, it's not muddy. It, it's, a good, it's a good thing all around. In spring, we said this is a perennial, so in springtime when you wanna get ready to plant, you wanna kill it. And you can mow it, you can till it under, but best of all, if you have the machinery and the equipment, which is not quite possible for small scale farmers or gardeners, you can crimp it. And crimping just simply means 
you know, you break it into bits. It's not the, uh, okay, so if you imagine a whole, a stick that you're breaking into four inch pieces, but you're not separating the pieces and leave that steel joined but broken. That's what crimping does. And you've driven over grass with your car, I'm sure. And what you do where you drive, the grass is flattened. But you come back a day later, it's all upright. So you wanna, you don't wanna just roll this over, it will come just upright. Again, you wanna roll it over and crimp it. And I'll show you the, the equipment that does that in a minute. Volts can be an issue, can be cold. It is very cold hardy and can be planted late. Now that's sig significant because many of these cover crops, you want to start them way before frost date and way before the killing cold comes in. But with annual rye, with the cereal rye grass, or oh, you can do it almost any time because one, it has rapid growth. Indeed, all rye grasses are king. When it is cold, they just grow and grow and grow. They are very happy to grow in cold weather. But this particular one can be grown almost any time close to frost time because it will just pop up and go, move, go, go uh, grow. Crimson clover, I put this one here. It's not the best for the northern climates. It's better in warmer climates in the south. I didn't know if we'd have people from southern Illinois, Kentucky, and elsewhere down that way, Mississippi. It's a great crop. It is a great soil builder. And as you can see there, when you have it that dense, you have complete weed control. You have no weeds. And yes, you can plant into it and keep the ground cover. Maybe just do a little more and you'll never get a tall crop from this so you'll not have issues with the shading. Okay. And this is an excellent nitrogen producer. You can imagine the amount of nitrogen being credited to the soil through the action of this clover. A whole lot. It has very vigorous growth, which is desirable. Again, you don't want a cover crop that takes forever to get up and running. You want one that is right, right away getting to do what it needs to, to be doing. When you grow this, when you plant, you, you seed it at 10 to 20 pounds per acre, but you also need to inoculate the seed. I need to address that here. Inoculating the seed means that you've added rhizobacteria to the seed. Because if you just plant the seed, they will find the little amount of rhizobacteria uh, microorganisms in the soil and associate with those. But you're going to get very little nitrogen credit. And you're not going, if that was one of your goals, you're not going to get as much nitrogen credit as you'd have had if you inoculate the seed with rhizobacterium. That gets them working right away instead of having to look for the bacterium. And then you have more of the rhizobacterium. Different species of cover crops require different species of rhizobacterium. And if you check the catalogs, that should let you know which rhizobacterium to buy, and it's easily available online. Um, clover is very easy to establish into existing crops, just broadcast it in there. You don't even need to cover it that much. It's very easy to grow. Annual ryegrass is another cover crop. This one, unlike cereal ryegrass, spends or partitions more of its energy into the roots. That's why it gets to be very deep rooted. And for scientists who are studying cover crops, that's what they wanna see. Because that's how you are improving soil structure and providing the nitrogen, for instance. The seed is cheaper than other cover crops. Why might it be difficult to kill in spring? A few times now I have read 
that annual ryegrass likes to behave as a biennial. Instead of dying the first year, because it's an annual crop or plant, instead of wanting to die and might want to live on for another year. Now that might, can be, that might be an issue, but you can also then go ahead and till it under or, or, or uh, mow it and keep it and just uh, plant around it, have, you know, live with it. So there are ways of dealing with that. And you seed it in August for best overwintering. And the seeding time is important. Pay special attention to what I said there. And we'll address that in a later slide. Let's turn our attention now from grasses to brassica species, the, the, you know, the cabbages, that family type. One of the plants that falls under the brassicas is rape. Rape is actually grown for oil by those who grow it. Um, the seed has high content of oil, but it also shows rapid fall growth. Remember, we want that. That's a great trait of any cover crop. And then the other good things, good thing, if you don't want it to go to next season, the winter kills it for you. So that again, you start the following year without the hassle of having to kill it. Great nutrient scavengers. They're growing that rapidly because they're absorbing lots of, nit lots of nutrients from the soil, which then becomes available to your subse subsequent crop. And because they die in the winter and start decomposing, you get great organ great amount of organic matter and the crop itself produces a whole lot of biomass. And then the good thing is that antimicrobials are released. So these target the bad uh, microorganisms, microbial organisms in the soil. The fusarium fungus, the rhizoctonia fungus, the phytophthora fungus, the undesirable community is targeted. It also targets nematodes and some weeds with its extracts that are antimicrobial, anti-plant, so to speak. And for that reason, because they, they, they when they are pretty young or pretty green and all that, because there is an accumulation of those antimicrobials, don't feed them to livestock either. Don't give your goats and cows uh, brassica species to eat, to consume. And I have taken one example of one of the mustards under the brassica species, the Kodiak mustard, which you see right, the name is right there, Kodiak mustard. Um, sorry, the Kodiak mustard. Um, in the past, we've always targeted damaging nematodes in the soil using non-host crops. Makes sense. If you plant a non-host crop for that particular nematode, which is bothering your corn, then it starves out because you just give it a non-host crop. On the other hand, you can choose to provide it with its host crop. Let the eggs hatch and once it starts feeding, um, plow that crop under. You just starved it again and that is a means of management. In the past they used to use chemical fumigants to suppress nematode numbers. Now methyl bromide and other fumigants that were supplied to the soil very expensive affair, very dangerous chemical to anybody, to any, you know, it was bad for the nematodes, it was bad for human. So there wasn't the best alternative. These days we have biofumicants, which we also call biopesticides, bio meaning life. Anything that is extracted from life would be a biological extract. In this instance, these extracts could be pesticides, so we call them biopesticides. And must, mustards do have that capability to produce biopesticides, which are now being used to control nematodes. That's what you're seeing on the right hand 
diagram over there. In the blastica tissue, you have glucosinolates, which if you allow the crop to grow and then chop it either by mowing down, you rupture the cells and they end up releasing a volatile biofumigant, which is also called an isothiocyanate. But you don't need to know that, just to know that there's a biofumigant, which then means this. Once you chop it down, it needs to be incorporated or plowed either into the soil so that the fumigation happens in the soil. So it's a bit more demanding, but it's okay for those who have equipment and it saves you tons of money because you're not having to buy chemical, um, chemicals to control the nematodes. And besides, it's good for the environment. That's what we wanna see. We talked about crimping using Aurora. This is a heavy metal Aurora, and as you can see, uh, it has this structure, which I'm not quite so sure how to describe, but as it rolls, it crimps the, the stalks of, say, cereal, rye grass. And that's what you want, so that the grass will not stand upright again. Is it available sometimes to borrow? Yeah, our community here was able to borrow one from USDA. I don't know if somebody else has it, they can let you use it. It's a one-time use. Your acre or two acres, you just do it one day and you're done. Getting ready for it to die, of course. And then you're ready to plant whenever, whenever the time comes. Hairy vetch is a legume and it produces produces, it makes nitrogen, if I may put it that way. And for uh, those people growing pumpkin crop, it's a great cover crop to go with. And you can do other crops, of course, not just pumpkins. Before growing it, before sowing it, planting it, you gotta uh, inoculate with bacteria, just like we talked about. Plant it in the fall, 30 days before frost date, to go dormant and then resume growth in the spring. And 20 to 35 pounds per acre. The range is dependent on your soil type. If your soil type is very acidic, I mean very sandy, do the higher level. And by the way, it's one of the better cover crops for sandy soils. It has a very deep taproot, which is great. Come springtime, monitor this crop very closely because as soon as you have 80% bloom or flower, kill it. Beyond that, if you let the flowers go to seed, then you have a new issue now of weeds and it will no longer be a cover crop. And you have more of all problems, you can live with this. Tillage radish, we talked about it in the beginning. It does disturb the top eight inches of the soil through its aggressive growth. You see that uh, tuber there, or root. It grows wide and tall or deep. So it's great for compacted or clay soils, if, what, if that's what you have. And this taproot can go four feet down. Not the entire um, root itself, but the thin root that, that it leads at the bottom there can go up to four feet. And it's a great absorber of nutrients. And it will, prov it will probably provide some of those nutrients back to a subsequent crop. Research has not been done yet to show what, how much of a nitrogen benefit is accrued because if that was known then you can you know they could be advising farmers that don't provide more than 60 pounds of nitrogen actual nitrogen because you're already getting that from this cover crop that hasn't been done yet but i would say it's a great great cover crop and you see the whiter part of that taproot here is one that heaved out of the ground 
which means when it hit a very compacted layer down there and couldn't go down more, it started growing out of the soil, heaving out. And you can still see you have quite a few inches of what was in the ground here, maybe four, five, six, seven inches. Sorry. So that is still good. It's a great cover crop as far as I'm concerned. And those of you that were asking about no-till, I recommend this one. Maybe there are others, but this is one that is easy to grow. And if you don't wanna do the tilling, you wanna do the no-till, then this is a great one. Another picture here just showing what happens the, as the cover crop roots die off to the radish, they leave channels. Those channels increase porosity, more water and air can go down there. And then the compaction is reduced. And new roots of the veggies, the veggies that you now grow after this can reach deeper, easier. No till where you don't till at all. Maybe you do minimal tilling, or maybe where you just do, where with the hole you're going to plant, whatever it is, crop that you're planting, is the only place you dig, you till, you do minimum tilling. What's the benefits of doing that? Your fruits are cleaner if you use the cover crop that will help you uh, with provision of a mulch. We talked about cereal rye, or even annual rye will provide you with a mulch if you don't till it under. If you just crimp it, then it will still be available for the crop that you're growing. Great for weed control. You don't have to worry about it now. If you're doing no till, so you're not interested in uh, weed control because it's already done for you. The legumes will give you nitrogen. Remember hairy veg, we give you quite a bit of that. When you're walking, you're not getting your boots muddy and wet. And then for those of us who are naturalists, the insect pollinators are having a great benefit. Cute buckwheat is great, by the way, it's a one, and by the way, it has nothing to, it's not a wheat. It's not related even to wheat, it's just called buckwheat. And it is a great crop to grow in the summer. Very fast growing, very, very easy to kill. Um, decomposes very fast. And uh, the pollinators love it. Of course, when you have a mulch, you're also preserving soil moisture. And we just said earlier on, you're improving soil health. So again, what is your cover crop for? Choose cover crops that address your need. Can it handle problematic soils? Remember, it could be compact, it could be clay. Will it thrive in fall? And will it thrive in early winter? Maybe not necessarily those two combinations. If it is hairy veg, yeah, it will thrive in the fall. And in our winter, so will cereal rye as well as annual rye, all those who do that. But if uh, tillage radish does the job you want it to do, reduce the compaction, even if it doesn't go to next year, it's not an issue. So consider all those factors. Um, I put in there that oats are easily available at the local feed store and they are cheap. We've grown those in our extension office behind there. There's this little garden. We always just grow them and all we do is broadcast by hand or sometimes I made a row of it, rows of uh, planting. But either way, ensure that you cover the crop with soil or just put in straw on top of what you just broadcast. You're preventing the birds and the mice and the voles from coming to feed on the same seed you just planted. So um, it's easy to grow them. 
when do we plant? Because you talk to any of the researchers that are dealing with cover crops, the timing is everything. You plant too early, the, the, the crop will maybe mature before the cold uh, part of the season comes in. And if it blooms, now you, pro, you have production of seed and you have a new issue of weeds. You don't want that. You plant too late and you just have a little tiny crop coming out of the ground before the cold, cold winter comes in. And you've not gained the benefits that you needed to gain. So timing is really everything. And here in Kankakee, I consider ourselves to be between zones five and six, so I call our zone five and a half. And we can plant these oats anytime between mid-August and September. In fact, better, beginning of August to mid-September. Again, you gotta watch what the weather is like, what the year is like, Look at this here, it's very unusual, very weird in its behavior, climate-wise, weather-wise. So watch what is happening. Make weather.gov, G-O-V, or weather.com your friend. Check that often. Tillage radish, again, early August to early September. And question marks just simply mean you gotta watch the weather or talk to somebody, write to us. We'll let you know what we think. And always keep in mind, what's the purpose of your cover crop? I can't tell you that enough. I can't emphasize that enough. Plant cover crops and grasses to enrich and break up compacted soil. And examples are given here. Um, oats, barley, annual or winter rye grass. And for those of us who are newcomers, annual or cereal rice are easier to do if you want them to go to the next year, the following spring. If it is during summertime that you wanna do your cover crop, do buckwheat. And I also wanted to say buckwheat is also great, again, in sandy soils. I've seen it growing vigorously in sandy soils. Great for organic matter. If you want to introduce more nitrogen into the soil, make more nitrogen, it's mostly the legumes that will do this. All those listed over there. And for us, well, there's this claim that you can get up to 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre of soil, but I've seen more um, of the literature talking about 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre. That's the more likely thing. But I'm sure in research, under very great, good conditions of rhizobacterium associating with the legume, they say you can go up to 300 pounds of N by of soil, that's pretty good. And as always, inoculate the seed. For us newcomers, I really recommend you use peas, the field peas. It's an easy crop to grow. And I've had somebody say, actually, they grew those. And because uh, the seeds are produced in ponds, it's very easy to just wait and the ponds, you harvest those when they are pretty young for food. You get the best of two hours there. The brassicas, we've already talked about them. Um, the advantages. Um, other crops, buckwheat accumulates phosphorus, and I think I also read that it also accumulates potassium in soil. So if you are to do your soil test and find out that your K and P are in short supply, consider buckwheat. For those of us who are naturalists, add the facilities to attract the pollinators. And because we've talked a, quite a bit about the advantages of cover crops, can you combine the, the nitrogen producers with the nutrient scavengers? Can you make a combination? Yes, you can. Remember the only one you cannot combine with anything else is uh, perennial rye, the cereal rye. 
It's called a cereal rye because it looks a bit like wheat and produces lots of biomass above. That one cannot be combined with anything else because you remember it has the allelopathic effect. But other combinations, and I put one here that any back, back, backyard gardener can use, is field peas and oats, both cheap and easy to plant. And the picture on the left there is Facilia, and on the right is buckwheat, attracting a bee. And I've shown you a picture of another easy combination where you can grow bachelor's buttons and crimson clover, the bachelor's button, will sequester, will scavenge the nutrients while the crimson clover will actually make the nitrogen if you had inoculated with rhizobacterium. And you can see that soil down there, the roots are growing freely, going deep and wide. The earthworms are having a great time. And what you can see are the microbial organisms that are allowing these plants to absorb nutrients. There is an association down there between the microbial organisms and the roots and the plants benefit quite a bit. Even the microbial organisms benefit. It's a mutual or symbiotic relationship down there. Great system. So you're planting most of these cover crops at least a month before the first frost date. Um, Cereal you right, remember, you can do that anytime. Inoculate the legumes, can't tell you that enough because you forget to do that, you don't get the benefit. And after drying the seeds that you have wetted in water containing rhizobacterium, plant. Don't let them dry, 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 like bone dry. Indeed, better yet, plant while they are still wet. That's the best way. And I have a cartoon here showing, or a diagram here showing what happens when you uh, plant your legume without inoculating the, the seed. This is the amount of, this is the roots you get. If you inoculate with the rhizobacterium, these are roots that you get, but plus white structures that we call nodules. The bacteria live in these nodules and it is in these nodules that you get nitrogen fixation happening. So the more of these nodules you have, the more nitrogen you get in the soil. Annual eye grass in the fall, we tolerate temperatures up to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit before going dormant. When it comes to the cold temperature, the rye grasses are king, they really grow. Crimson clover and the field peas and, uh, and oats want in the plus, although it's still cold. Remember that your refrigerator is 34 degrees Fahrenheit. So any of these temperatures are colder than your refrigerator. But they still grow up to some point. If your soil is salty or dry, quite droughty, barley will grow pretty good. Fava beans will grow eight feet tall. How much better could it be for your organic matter production? The bottom there, I have shown this handheld tool which you can use to spread your seed if you want to use it. Um, the other instruments like this that you can use if you don't want to broadcast with your hands. Oats, I put that again there to tell you, to let you know that um, the roots can go up to six feet in the soil. If there's no hurdles or any difficulties getting down, they'll go deep. And you know the advantage now of the roots going deeper into the soil and production of some biomass at the same time. And it accuse in the winter, so you have no issues with killing it in spring. Cowpeas are great. They have a deep tap root and they tolerate drought. Aim for 60 to 90 day growth. They are not great when it comes to winter, so it's more of a spring crop. And same thing with soybean. You want to grow soybean in the fall. It won't grow that much. Um, 
if you want to grow earlier than say August with the aim of providing you uh, nitrogen and as, as use as a cover crop, get the late maturing varieties that will grow a bit longer. They will tolerate the cold a bit more. Do that. Buckwheat is quick maturing, quick, quick decomposing. That's great. And the clover species can be broadcast in snow. I've had people go out in February and March in the snow and just broadcast the seed. When the snow gets out of the way, the seeds will be resting in the soil, the soil will be freezing and thawing at the same time and the coverage is minimal. And the, 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 the clover will grow easily from there onwards. How do you plant your cover crop? Uh, it's like any other crop. Loosen the soil, rake it to remove the huge clumps and you know, if you have any rocks or boulders, remove those. Then you spread the seeds evenly and liberally. Remember, you're not planting a, a crop where you, you're worried about the spacing. Just get a dense mat of this crop. Check your packet for instructions. How much should you put per acre or per unit amount of space that you have? And then you can cover the seed lightly with soil. Remember, these are very small seeds. And you're covering because the birds will have a few days eating those if you don't do that, as well as the mice. Or get yourself some straw and spread thinly over that. And then give water, of course. It's a crop like any other. And some of them will go dormant during the frost period and then resume growth before the cold, cold period comes later. Springtime, you monitor the cover crops. Early bloom, if anything is starting to bloom, it's already done what you wanted it to do. It's done its job. Get rid of it. Okay. It's generally recommended that you wait after crimping it down or after mowing it down or tilling it under, wait a few weeks. So you do this way before you know, like for us here, the first or second week of May is when we plant. So if you can do that mid-April so that you can wait a few weeks, that would be very helpful. Sometimes you can, oh yeah, then we come to buying the cover crop seed. Where can you buy the cover crop seed? Online would be your best bet. And some of these cover crops come mixed up. And I don't know if, you, if you're seeing what I'm seeing here, but you have legumes and grasses mixed in here. And the brassica as well, mixed in here. So you get best of everything. However, go back to your goal. What is your goal? If your goal is to amend the soil structure because it's too compact or it's too clayey, you only have 8% of daikon radish. That will not do what you really wanted to do. So you better check what is in the composition. Sometimes you can even ask the company, you know, to increase the quantity of one over the other, or just have two. If you just, you can just have two of these and, or three, a legume, a grass, and a brassica species, and stop right there. But it's all up to you. And you can see there's an advantage here because they've already inoculated the seed, some of the seed, with the nitrogen fixing bacteria for you. So again, that helps. This one was True Leaf from True Leaf Market. On the other, oh, and they also give you the rate of seeding. Very little, in this case, one pound covering 600 square feet. That's only 20 by 30 feet or 15 by 40 feet. That's quite a bit for a backyard. But if it's your garden out there and you're doing a little bit more of growth, it's really not a whole lot that is required. 
Where well, can you purchase the seed? That was a question by one of you. Online would be a great place to do that. Very many companies out there selling cover crops because they have become they have become the new thing to do. So I didn't even know Home Depot. You could go there and find a cover crop. That surprised me. Go to the local seed store, ask them if they have oats. They probably have, I don't know what they would have oats for. Is it for the bad seed? I, bad seed, I don't know. Find out what they have. They may have that and it's cheap. Or go to your farmer friend. If you have a farmer friend, and I'm talking about a field crops farmer, ask him for two pounds of soybean. Really, should they, should they say no to that? I don't think so. Um, yeah, get yourself some seed from there. I have lots of references, but I want to recommend, and I sent those of you in the audience or listening to this, I sent you the first one here by Oregon State University Extension Service. It's very easy to read. On page two, they have a table showing all the cover crops and their benefits and when to plant. And all those, th there are quite a number of things they talk about. I found it easy to read and nice, uh, nice to, uh, to look at. For master gardeners, there is the cover crops in your school garden. That's available for you. Over here, we have a few articles or references from University of Illinois. Uh, and I've given you the websites if you want to read more. Now, for those of you that want to educate yourselves more, this is a book from um, ATRA, A-T-T-R-A. It publishes books for farmers and it's a not-for-profit organization. This book is available online, you can buy it, it's not very expensive. It is also easy to read and for commercial growers, there may be something you wanna get for yourself. And I thank all of you for always sending the questions ahead of time. You sing cover crops in a note to your garden. And I think I've addressed that quite a bit. You can use tilling radish, that will tear the land, they will break the top eight inches for you. All you can use them are rye grass types and just let them be, just mow them down without having to cut them around, I mean to, to plow them under. And you can keep them throughout your season. Walk around them, just make a hole for planting whatever you're planting in wherever you, wherever, in spots where you want to plant and then leave the rest of the ground covered. That way the cover crop stays in your no-till garden. Strategy for planning space. Example, if I want a winter cover in a space currently used for tomatoes, how can I incorporate planting the cover crop at the proper time while not sacrificing harvest from the tomato crop? So in August, you have your tomatoes that are trellised, trelli, trellised, and they're in full production. So below here, there's not so much lying down. No reason why you can't come with your legume cover crop and just broadcast it, let it grow. By the time the tomatoes are done, your cover crop will be coming up. That would be my suggestion. Never quite understood what this question was about, deterring catalogs from your flower beds. I would like the person who asked this to get in touch with me. My email is at the end. Make it clearer for me. I'm not quite sure what that is. Recommended species and mixes. Termination of winter hardy species and planting methods. Again, I addressed this during the presentation, but if it wasn't well addressed, please let me know and I'll get back to it. Considerations for clay soil or compact soil. Uh, my one go-to cover crop is tillage radish. 
in addition to collecting the leaves that fall off from your maple trees and other oak trees, put them in the garden. You get your soil amended over time. And I'm not talking about a year or two years. It should take a few years. Always put organic matter back into the soil. In fact, some people say dig a trench. Put all those leaves in a trench so that this season you plant where you didn't dig. And then next year, plant where you had made the trenches and keep doing that. Over time, you amend your soil. How long before planting after it's turned over? Let's go with two, three, four weeks. That will do it. With the cereal rye, at least three weeks. No question about it. Where to buy and acquire small quantities of seed for cover crops or a small plot? Online, they are selling a pound, two pounds. I'm sure if I went to Pro Harvest Seeds here in Kankakee and said I want two pounds of oats, they're going to get me those, or even two pounds of soybean. I think they'll give me that. I've done it, I've, I've done it before. So uh, go online. These days, online is great, Amazon.com. Let's go there and get your seed from there in small quantities. Or talk to a farmer friend. They'll give you some little amount of soybean. Okay. Those were the questions. And um, I would appreciate if you let me know if they're not answered as well as they should. Nathan Johanning is the specialist, U of I specialist, who is dealing with cover crops all the time. It is his special area and he's the expert. Please write to him if you have, if you are so inclined, just I would be quite happy if you wrote to him as well. Keep checking our website for other programs. You see our unit here, Grande Kankakee and Wheel. But if you also want to see recorded programs or presentations, including this one, you can go to our Small Farms YouTube website, which is given right here. I think I'm almost done, but I was going to demonstrate how to cover crop. And I hope you're seeing my screen, which I'm sharing with you. If I select a state or province, which will be Illinois, and then select a county, which in this case is Kankakee, the screen gets populated with a whole lot of information. What's my cash crop? It may not be a cash crop, but I will be growing warm season vegetables. And the planting date, let's say I planted May 11. Harvest date, I'm expecting to do that in July, let's say June, July, July 15. Just select a drainage class. Let me just say my place is well drained so there's no flooding. And goal number one is to provide, say, nitrogen, nitrogen source. Okay. You've just seen when I clicked on that, most of the cover crops went off the screen because they don't provide nitrogen. I'm left with alfalfa, with clovers, and the cowpeas, and hairy veg. I'm left with those. And at the same time, I'm left with a, with a few mixes of those, like cover, you know, hairy veg, ryegrass, hairy veg, you know, those types of things. And I don't know if you're seeing that. When is the reliable establishment time? So that's the one for most of these where you see green, if you see yellow, uh, freeze to risk establishment, I need to be considering early September. And frost seeding, if I was going to do frost seeding, I can wait till December for some of those clovers. Red clover particularly can be done in, like I said, in snow, just wait until snow disappears, it gets to the ground. So just a short one here to help you decide what you want. And um, again, play with it. It is an easy, 
user-friendly tool. And thank you for your attention. Appreciate your attention and um, keep, keep uh, checking on us. Thank you so much. Wish you a happy season.